Season previews continue with Thomas Harley. Can he build off his impressive run from last season? Will Essa Lindell return to form in 2023? And is a sophomore slump in order for head coach Pete DeBoer? That's next on Locked On Stars. Your Locked On Stars, your daily podcast on the Dallas Stars. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Howdy, Stars fans, and welcome back to another episode of Locked On Stars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every single day. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button, put that notification bell on as well, so you never miss an episode of Locked On Stars. And thank you so much for making this podcast your first listen of the day. Happy Friday to all you Stars fans out there. I hope you're ready for the weekend. I know I am. It is beautiful right now, currently in Wisconsin. And I know uh, if any of you are up north, this is about the last month that you can continue to run around and uh, soak up that sunshine because it's beautiful and perfect. But uh, winter is coming. Uh, and I'm sure anybody back home in Texas uh, I'm sure it's still scorching and really, really hot. But uh, right now, it's it's perfect here. So uh, I'm enjoying it and ready for a fantastic weekend. Training camp has started as well. So there's tons of content coming out. I'm sure many of you have soaked up, which is so, so good because hockey is officially back. Before we jump into today's episode, it is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more right now. New customers can bet $5 and get 200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. All righty. Let's go ahead and jump into some Thomas Harley talk. And uh, I wanted to talk about Harley and Essa Lindell here today because I thought this would be a really intriguing maybe partner or pairing for the upcoming year. But uh, as I was scrolling through the Twitter, I'm sure as many of you were today, uh, I saw Saad Youssef, of course, wonderful, wonderful reporter over there at The Athletic who covers the stars. Uh, and he actually reported months ago and he and he took a little screenshot of the expert. I, I love following his work that, well, it looks like Harley may start the year with Hawk and Paw and then Lindell will end up playing with Lundquist. That's at least what the stars may be thinking here to begin the year. So we'll see how that all uh, all kind of shapes up. I know I mentioned yesterday, I thought maybe this would be a nice pairing. So uh, that's my fault for assuming, but uh, entertain me, will you? Because uh, Thomas Harley, I think, is just so, so intriguing. Uh, I mean, you think back to when the stars drafted him in 2019, uh, 18th overall pick. So he was highly touted, you know, coming out of the junior ranks. And he's just 22 years old. and I remember when we drafted him, uh, I looked at his stature and everything. I was, oh, it's a bigger Miro. Uh, you know, has that kind of offensive ability, can skate effortlessly, which we have seen now for uh, half a dozen games or so. And, uh, you know, he came up at the end of, I want to say it was 2020, maybe the bubble year at some point, and he played a few games. And, and you could see the game was a little too fast for him at that point in time. And, uh, you know, he needed to develop some more in the AHL. And and he came into last year's training camp uh, wanting to make a name for himself and and finally cracked the lineup. And, uh, you know, the, the Stars felt that he wasn't ready quite yet. And they sent him back down to Texas in the AHL. And you got to give props to a guy like that who goes down there and he put in the work. And and he was, he was spectacular. 34. Four points in 66 games for Texas. And then, you know, he comes up at the end of the year and he had a huge impact. I, I mean, without him in the lineup for the stars in the playoffs, who knows if they get past a team like the Kraken? He he played excellently and they found a nice home with Harley and Hanley at the two H's on the back end. And, and they really thrived. And you couldn't say that about some of the other defensive pairings namely Essel Lindell and, and Hockenpah, who were as inseparable as Miro and Suter have been. That was the longest pairing, really, of defense in all season with Lindell and Hockenpah. And you kind of had this makeshift with Hanley and Harley at the end of the year, and uh, they were really, really solid. They were kind of your zero-sum defensive pairing where they're not always going to produce you know, a ton offensively, but they're not going to give much up either. And... And Harley is just, 
Uh, he's so, so fun. You could see it this year when he came up to this past season that it just all clicked for him. He he skates effortlessly. He jumps up in the play, and he's just got great size and that long reach of his. Uh, it, it's going to be so fun to watch him play a full season. He hasn't even played a full season worth of games yet uh, in the NHL. So uh, I, I think there's so much to build off of from last season. And I don't know what his ceiling is because I could see him being a 50 to 60 point guy here uh, in the NHL. And maybe he has the ability to get up to 70 and kind of live in that Miro world. And imagine having two guys like Harley and Miro. And I have to say that is my dream pair for the Dallas stars watching Haskinen and Harley. Uh, man, that would be so, so much fun. It, it, it kind of would give you that Carlson and Burns type of pairing almost where there's just so much potential offensively, except way better defensively. All right. Uh, you know, let's let's not give too much credit to Carlson and Burns for their defensive capabilities. We know Miro is a step above and I think Harley <laughs> will be as well as he continues to continues to grow. So I, I think there's tons of expectations and he's going to play a lot of minutes, which is great. And it feels like he's going to be kind of an answer to some of the depth problems that the stars have had. Um, and you can finally break up that Lindell Hockenpah because the issues with the Lindell Hockenpah, not to get too much into it now, but the two characteristics that you don't really think about with Lindell and Hockenpah, their strength is their skating ability. And it makes it really tough in today's NHL with the way you defend because it's almost like five on five now. It, it Because, uh, you know, defenders are up by the goal line. They're jumping in the play. It's almost like it, it's five on five. You grab your man and you follow him around the defensive zone. And Harley is just that modern dynamic type of defenseman where Skating is one of his most biggest strengths and, you know, he can hit that outlet pass. He just has so many more options uh, when he has the puck in his own end, which makes him a, a really good defender. And uh, I feel like we just have such a small sample size of him too. Uh, to get to see him play in an 82 game slate and to see where he kind of fits into this lineup and, who knows? He may end up get a lot of he maybe end up getting a lot of power play time by the end of the season because that second unit, who knows what they're gonna trot out there, right? Uh, in the past, it's been Ryan Suter kind of quarterback quarterbacking that second unit power play. Uh, and as I said yesterday, please no more of that. We have too much talent on the back end. Is Niels Lundquist gonna take control because he got some reps with that unit last season? Uh, if Harley can find his way and wiggle his way into that spot. Uh, I mean, you have two deadly offensive uh, defensemen on both power play units with him and Miro. Uh, I mean, who knows what this power play uh, is going to look like here for this upcoming season. That's what makes me really excited about him because, and also he has that great relationship with Miro. Uh, some of those interviews that came out last year, oh man, he's unreal some of the things he can do you can tell he kind of has an admiration for him uh which which definitely helps and I, I i can't wait to see that dynamic too of miro who we always think of as the young kid right and look he's not 10 years older than harley uh only a couple of years maybe even not even two but to kind of have that dynamic where he's miro's now Pretty much, he's a veteran in this league. He's becoming that kind of leader of the defensive group. And I think it will be great to see Harley and him interact throughout the season and maybe pick up some things and maybe Harley makes some move. And you're like, it looks like the second coming of, of Miro. I, I think that'll be really fun to, uh, to watch and see play out throughout the year. So I am super, super stoked for Thomas Harley because of course he had high expectations as an 18th overall pick. I mean, you're hoping he makes an impact. I mean, no less than uh, a top four defenseman. That's what you're thinking uh, when you take a guy like that at, at that spot. And uh, it's the opportunity. Now he has the opportunity to, to, you know, stranglehold a, a, a great, 
a great spot here in this lineup, and it will be really, really fun to watch Harley kind of get going and to see who he plays with. Uh, I think Essa or Hawkenpah would be a, a nice pairing because uh, one thing that Lindell and Hawkenpah kind of lack is their skating ability. They're not the best uh, skaters, which can sometimes – make it a problem to get out of your own zone. Yes, they may be strong defensively, but when it comes to breakouts and getting up on the rush, that's not one of their strong suits. So Harley can maybe balance out one of those guys. Who knows? Maybe they go back to the Hanley uh, Harley matchup as well. So tons of answers and, and, and questions. I think which makes it so fun to talk about this decor because for the forward groups, we almost have an idea of who's going to stick together. But on the back end, yeah, it's kind of a toss-up of who's going to be with who. So uh, we'll continue to keep an eye out on that throughout training camp. Uh, and that'll wrap up some some Thomas Harley talk. Uh, young guy, man, 22 years old, has not even played a full season worth of games left. So uh, a, a ton to uh, look forward to uh, for Thomas Harley. Let's go ahead and jump into some Essa Lindell talk coming up in just a moment uh cuz he had a little bit of a down year a season ago can we expect him to return to form and we will get to that next but first today's episode of locked on stars is brought to you by bird dogs first off bird dogs make you look good they have stretch khaki shorts designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and leg giving you a truly sculpted Look, for all you hockey players out there, these are the pants for you, especially the successful ones. Unlike myself, that's why I'm speaking to you on this mic currently. They have the big legs. This are the pants for you. They have shorts. They do the exact same thing as Lululemon, but they fit way better. Regular shorts that are made of not that stiff, restricting cotton, and they also have that anti-stink sweat wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day long, which is important for all you Texans out there because it is scorching uh, in the fall. In the summer, these are definitely the pants you need. So go to birddogs.com slash locked on NHL. They have tons uh, of different options, joggers, shorts, all that good stuff. You can enter a promo code locked on NHL at checkout for a free Bird Dogs water bottle with your order. That's birddogs.com slash locked on NHL for a free water bottle at checkout. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. We promise you. All righty, let's get into some Essa Lindell talk here on Locked on Stars. Go ahead and uh, check out yesterday's episode as well. We started our season previews for some defensemen. We went into some Miro Haskinen and Ryan Suter previews, which I think are very interesting because I think those two guys are kind of end up on the opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, and check out on Monday as well. We'll continue the season previews for the decor we'll probably wrap it up as well go into some of the guys like Lundquist and Hanley and some of the guys that may be rotating in and out and maybe come up with the pairings that uh, we think we're going to see uh, on opening night as well I have something in the works right now I think on Monday that I will announce so I'm not gonna say anything yet I don't want to you know leave it up to chance or anything but uh, stay tuned for next week Got a lot of fun exciting things planned as we're kicking things off because Locked on Stars is back, baby. So excited to be with you. Hopefully uh, you're having a wonderful Friday and uh, you're ready to enjoy the weekend. All righty, Essa Lindell. Well, Essa did not quite have the year that we probably expected or have been accustomed to uh, last season. You know, he's always kind of been that defensive stalwart for the Stars and you can kind of play him in every situation. He did get some power play time, but he's a guy that blocks shots. Uh, he's reliable. Uh, he's available most nights. He, he's not injured all the time. Uh, and he loves to block shots, uh, which is key. And you need guys like that. Uh, but last year with the pairing of him and Hawk and Paw, uh, they struggled in the playoffs, especially just the, the speed of the game seemed uh, to be a, a bit too fast for two guys like that. And it, it seems like it's time to split that pairing up and, and have Essa and Hawk and Paul play with somebody uh, that skating and skills a little bit more of their strength. And maybe they can make up for some of those uh, deficiencies. Uh, one thing about Lindell, he's 29 years old, so 
you know, this is kind of the the beginning to the end, so to speak, you would think, especially for uh, a defenseman that has the characteristics that Lindell does. He's a stay-at-home defenseman, right? He's supposed to be great in his own zone. Uh, and as I kind of touched on in the previous segment, it's really hard to do that when you're just not a phenomenal skater, right? Your options become more limited when uh, you're not just able to skate the puck out of your own zone. Like Miro Haskinen's a, a one-man breakout crew. He can do it himself just because he has the capability. And, and Lindell just doesn't really have that skill set. He has to rely on others, and he, he has to rely on getting off the glass and out, which is not the most uh, accustomed to, to scoring goals, especially in this system with Pete DeBoer, where it's kind of high-flying, like the wingers want to go. As soon as you take possession, like let's get up and down the ice and, and go on the uh, opposing net miner. You have him under contract for two more years, uh, which I think he's still a great value at five point eight million dollars uh, a year. And like I've said before, I don't really care to look into money too much and what guys are making. It, it, you know, th that's the the GM and, and owner have to deal with that stuff. Uh, you know, w w what is he doing for us? He did lose a, a couple minutes of time on ice last season from the year prior, which it's probably no surprise. Look, Miro is going to have a lot of usage and he's going to play in a lot of spots. But I think that's good for, for Lindell. You, you don't want him to have to play 25 minutes uh, a night. And it's been different when Klingberg left as well, like. Lindell and Klingberg were kind of that pair for, for years and they were good defensively and they chipped in offensively just because Klingberg was of course, so offensive minded. He, he, he finished with about the same production though, 24 points and he played in 82 games. Um, uh, and, and I, and I think that's key to keep guys like him uh, around the issue and the concern that we have because we've become so accustomed to S Lindell. He's great in his own zone. He he's just fantastic defensively. And he just shuts the door uh, on opponents is you, you look at some of his percentages and some of his grades in the defensive zone. They weren't all that great, even on the PK. Uh, and I took a look at his war card, which I, I sometimes like to, it gives you a little snapshot on a player, which, you know, statistics and, and, and stuff are just a part of the story. Right, right. They don't tell you the whole thing, but uh, his PK percentage was 32 percent, which uh, was a little weird just due to the fact that, you know, he's a great shot blocker. He's kind of a stay at home and, you know, keeps you out of the front uh, of your own net. And, you know, he wasn't graded out that highly as, a, you know, a penalty killer, which can be concerning, especially as he's going to continue to lose a step. Right. As you get into your 30s. Uh, you're not going to get much faster. Uh, and Lindell, Lindell wasn't a phenomenal skater to begin with. And and that's why uh, it, you're you're going to have to pair him with maybe even a Nils Lundqvist, which uh, it, it looks like that's going to be the start of the year. Or Thomas Harley, who has the ability to uh, provide, you know, the great skating and the ability to get out of your own zone without always having to use your forward group. Uh, in today's NHL where it's up and down and you, you got to get the puck moving north and south quickly because the game just feeds offense. Uh, you need guys that have the dynamic defensemen. I mean, there's so many to count. The Adam Foxes of the world, the Miros, the Kale McCars. That's just not Essel and Dell, which, which is fine. And, and you don't want a full team of Kale McCars and certain things like that. That's uh, you, you got to have that healthy balance, which I think the stars do. Right. And that's why I think it's so necessary. And, and I love guys like Essel and Dell because uh, of course you, you want your, your guys that are offensive gifted, but uh, every team has that mix, right? Some big guys that, uh, you know, they're going to lay the body on you deep in your zone guys that are penalty kill specialists and then you have your guys that can do a little of both and all that. You, you got to have a mix and match. And I think now for the stars sake, you just got to pair them properly. I, I, I think the coaching staff will have uh, a hard time kind of coming up with, okay, this guy works with this. This is not working right now. We need to try something else. And, and Essel and Dell, uh, the nice thing about him is he's easy to play with because you know, he's going to take care 
of the defensive duties <laughs> more often than not. So you don't have to worry about him always jumping up in the play and, and pinching because that's just not his style. Uh, how many times do you see Esselandell cruising through neutral ice, weaving his way through traffic and getting a shot on net? Uh, probably a handful of times in his career because when he does, oh my God, Esselandell's at the tops of the circle and he's he's about to shoot. It, it, it almost is surprising every time he, uh, he's in the slot and he has a, a, a shot at the netminder one-on-one. So uh, I, I, I think Essa will, I think he's going to regress a little bit more, but I think with the pairing that they're going to find for him, if it's a Harley or a Lundquist, is really, really going to help him out. And, uh, you know, he's a stable defenseman and he's available, right? He has not gotten hurt much uh, throughout his his uh, years in, in his career. Uh, and those guys are, you know, your best, avail- your best ability is availability, right? It's the old cliche, uh, but it's true. Uh, and, and he'll play a lot and he'll probably end up somewhere in the third to fourth highest time on ice for the Stars, I would think. Uh, I think Harley's probably going to be third. Uh, Suter and Harley will probably be jockeying for that position. And of course, Miro, I mean, play him half the game. Why don't you? Why not? Let's let's have Miro play 33 minutes a night. Uh, I, you know, to be honest, they probably, if they, if they could, they definitely would, but uh, we got to, got to ease back on the young man. That's for sure. Uh, all righty. So it's a, a little bit about S. Lindell. You know, he's 29 years old. He, he's going to be kind of the beginning of the end uh, and they have him on contract for two more years. So, uh, it'll be fun to watch kind of the pairings that get lifted out there. I know I beat the dead horse with, with that statement, but uh, it, it really is a lot of questions kind of revolving around this team because uh, there was a lot of questions in the playoff run last year. The Stars just did not really hold up defensively. The Hawk and Paul Lindell was pretty atrocious. And, you know, Connor Miller, who played every day in the regular season, was in and out of the lineup come playoff time and they did have to mix and match and find different ways to win. And you have to adapt, which is uh, that's the nature of the game too. You you can't be stuck doing the same thing consistently. You have to find new ways to almost innovate and change yourself from within. And I think the great thing is the starts have answers from within and they're hopefully going to find those. And, and why should I test that? Because they've been good for a while and they seem to press the the right buttons last year. Uh, You got to press a lot of right buttons to get to the Western conference finals. So uh, you're not going to see me griping too much yet. Okay. Let's uh, go ahead and talk about Pete DeBoer coming up. And uh, I thought this would be fun just uh, because we always talk about sophomore slumps with, you know, the players and even Wyatt Johnson, will he have a, a sophomore slump, but let's go ahead and take a look at Pete DeBoer. Because, you know, I dived in some research and, you know, I looked at the numbers just from one year to the other after his first year someplace else, which we know he had a ton of success in his first year somewhere. So we'll jump into a little bit of those numbers in just a moment. Here we go. Final segment of the week underway. And why not talk a little bit about the Stars bench boss, Pete DeBoer. And uh, he had a phenomenal year last year. I think we can uh, all agree on that. And uh, we knew coming in about how much success uh, that he's had in places uh, in his first season. Um, So I thought it would be cool and just take a, a little bit deeper dive and take a look at some of his numbers the following year, right? Has he been able to uh, kind of, I guess, sustain that success for another season? Because, you know, you see some coaches where the first year's great and it really dips, or maybe it's kind of a, a, a slow decline. So I, I thought it would be fun just to take a look at some of the numbers uh that he, he's possessed after his first year somewhere. So, well, we, we started in New Jersey because he won the Western Conference. And, and I took a look at points percentage is kind of how I based it because uh, one of them was a lockout year. You also had the 56 game year uh, or 56 game schedule after COVID and all that hoopla. So uh, I, I kind of went by point percentage uh, to kind of compare. So in New Jersey, his first year, when they won the Eastern Conference, 622 point percentage. He ended up with 
.500 in the lockout year. Uh, they were exactly 500, as it says, uh, with their points percentage, and they missed the playoffs. So not a ton of success in New Jersey after year one. And of course, things change a ton. Uh, you know, I, I get that. Some teams can be completely different. You don't always hold on to the guys that you have. And there could be a lot of turnover. Like, it's a business <laughs> at, at the end of the day. Alrighty, how about the San Jose Sharks when he met up with Joe Pavelski for the first time in San Jose? He actually got better the next season after they won the Western Conference and they lost in the Stanley Cup Finals. So they had a .598 points percentage in year one. They were just a, a smidge better, .604, but they did lose in the first round that year. So that brings us to Vegas. And of course, Vegas got off to a, a phenomenal start. Stanley Cup champions now defending you. It's like disgusting to even have to say it. Uh, but uh, in his second year, he actually finished better as well. Points percentage wise, 0.732, which was a, a touch better, which is kind of incredible because uh, they finished first both years and they were first uh, in the Western Conference uh, in his first couple of years with the Golden Knights. And that was in the 56 game season, his second year. And of course, that was the weird playoffs. They ended up losing to uh, the Canadians in that semifinals, remember, because it wasn't really like a Western Eastern Conference thing, just a, a really, really weird schedule. And the thing about Vegas that was so intriguing too, why he was there, there was just tons of injuries for him. And that's why it was almost weird that Vegas let him go, and hey, by all means, it worked out for them, I guess, at the end of the day. But the amount of man games Vegas lost was incredible. Uh, and their goaltending situation was weird. Remember with Robin Leonard and Marc-Andre Fleury and his agent and all that stuff blew up when the Stars beat him uh, uh, in the in the bubble cup run. So, uh, it, you know, a lot of that stuff in, in, is probably – no fault of his own. Look, injuries happen and, and guys are going to miss games. And a lot of that uh, Pete DeBoer can't control, which uh, I, I think it's just fun to see because, you know, he has, you know, over his history, he's had some success, if not better in his second year. So I think that bodes well for the Stars team. And look, I think the Stars team is different from those San Jose's and Vegas where, well, well, also Vegas wants to throw money at everybody and they want to go after it every single year. But, you know, San Jose was uh, kind of in its prime and that's why he had a lot of success, right? You know, Joe was uh, right in the middle of his prime. You had uh, Burns on the back end, Couturier and uh, Couture, I should say, and all those, uh, all those guys in, in San Jose. And it almost feels like he may have some of that mix here in Dallas where you have this young core and your older veterans, and um, I, I think DeBoer's just a, a fantastic coach, and it, it, it's just the coaching position in the NHL is just so weird, too, because it's kind of this fire and rehire situations where guys just show up, and next thing you know, like, I mean, last year, at, at one point, three of the four top teams uh, were led by former Stars coaches. <laughs> we had Lindy Ruff in New Jersey, uh, Jim Montgomery and Rick Bonus, and it's just the carousel of these guys where just sometimes it works in places and maybe there's something to be said about if you overstay your welcome, uh, at some point your message just doesn't get received. And, and that's why it's weird for guys like even John Cooper down in Tampa Bay where he's been there for almost a decade, I think uh, that is, that does not happen in the NHL. You know, if, if you're there for three years, you're on the hot seat at that point. Uh, it, it, it almost doesn't matter what you've done. Look at Vegas. They've had tons of success uh, uh, since the infancy of their franchise, and they're not afraid to make changes. Um, and I don't think Pete DeBoer is going to go anywhere soon. Uh, I think Jim Neal hit the just nail on the head with him because it was a team that needed to embrace just this modern age run and gun type of play. And Rick Bonus, yes, he was incredible. There's a couple ways to skin a cat, right? Uh, but I, I, I think with this crew that you have here in Dallas, it was important for Dilbor to be here. And uh, we saw it work um, like right away. It, it wasn't a, like 25 games in, ah, uh, you know, we'll see. 
I mean, right off the hop, a month in the seat. Oh, this this is different. We have not seen this before, uh, which is awesome. And you know, the Stars played in the uh, top three, the Western Conference, uh, for the entire entirety of the season, which uh, is important, right? Like, I don't want to be stressing come April that we have to win three out of five to get into the playoffs. Uh, no more mediocre hockey. We have the personnel and the ability to play with the best in the Western Conference day in and day out. We should be with a month and a half to go in the season. Hey, we're chilling. We got our spot. Like, let's try to get the number one seed. Of course, you want that home ice advantage and certain things like that. But it's nice to feel that comfortability where you're not hanging on for, for every inch. And it was a it was a nice change of pace last season. And I've seen tons of your comments. Like, it, it feels so good to, like, you're not panicking. We're uh, every year, yeah, they could be good. Uh, we'll see. They'll be a tough out if they get in, right? But they got to get in. They'll be a tough out. It's just, it's it's an awesome mindset to be in where we just expect it now to, to get to almost a promised land. And um, at this point, uh, like what is a successful season? Uh, please uh, reach out to me. What, what is a successful season for this stars team? And we'll continue to talk about this. I think up to opening night, well, what is going to be our idea uh, of a successful, a successful year? Because I'm someone, man, if you make it to the Western conference, that is really, really tough to do. One of the final four teams left. That's huge. Um, but we're kind of creepy to that area where it's okay. Like it's Stanley cup or bust, right? Like Boston last season, like, uh, which I think it's a great thing to come, uh, to, to have, it, it can bring some unwanted distractions, of course, and high expectations, uh, are not always a good thing. Um, but maybe it will for this crew and they'll rise to the occasion. So Alrighty, that'll wrap up uh, some more season previews for today on Locked on Stars. Uh, please hit that subscribe button. Make sure you never miss an episode of Locked on Stars. And thank you so much for making this your first listen of the day. And thank you so much for a, a wonderful week so far. I mean, we're only three days into this thing, but uh, again, your comments have all been phenomenal. I appreciate the warm welcome. So, so pumped to be a part of this community. Let's have a wonderful year. Uh, year. Feel free. Reach out to me on Twitter, X, whatever they want to call it. Joey the Jet 19. I got some of my work on there. You can uh, ask me questions, uh, talk about my normal life and stuff because, you know, I'll probably be playing golf or something like that because uh, <laughs> those are things I enjoy besides talking uh, stars hockey. So thank you so much for tuning in once again. Always a pleasure to be with you. We'll be back on Monday, but for now, so long, Stars fans.